Einstein's Field Equations, Episode 5.1. Welcome everybody to this fresh new episode on YouTube videos uh, which I'm making on Einstein's Field Equations. Well, I have mentioned this episode to be episode 5.1 because there will be two parts of this episode which deals with components of Einstein's Field Equations. Now, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, I will be specifically speaking and explaining about these three concepts, the Ricci curvature tensor, the Ricci scalar and the stress energy momentum tensor. So there will be another episode followed by this one, which will be episode 5.2, where we will take all these components into account. So this is the first episode dealing with Einstein's field equations. Well, before I start my video, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all those subscribers who have commented and expressed their thanks and has been a source of motivation. I am specially thankful to Randy Martin, uh, who has suggested to keep the background uh, sound to be as low as possible. I try to make a video previous to this, which, which has a background sound, but it has really disturbed a lot. So Randy, I have put up the entire background video so that the explanation is much clearer. Thanks to Twinkle Pal, who has uh, been motivating me and she watches the lectures. Cosmo Philosophy and Science who has been a source of motivation and uh, he or she comments on my videos and to Prabal who has expressed thank you. So a big thanks to all of you who has subscribed and commented and expressed their interest in my channel Physics for Students. So we would be dealing primarily with the components of Einstein's field equations. As you can see, this is basically the expanded form of Einstein's field equations. So we would start with R mu nu, which is the Ricci curvature tensor. We will also deal with this single R Ricci curvature scalar, the G mu nu, which is the metric tensor, lambda, which is the cosmological constant, the capital G, which is the good old Newton's gravitational constant, and C, which is the speed of light, followed by T mu nu, which is the stress energy momentum tensor. Well, in this particular video, we would be taking R mu nu, which is the Ricci curvature tensor, followed by the Ricci curvature scalar, and T mu nu, which is the stress energy momentum tensor. Rest of the part, metric tensor, gravitational constant, the speed of light, as well as T 8 pi g, we will take uh, uh, into account in the coming videos. Otherwise, it will be too lengthy to explain in a single video. So first let us uh, uh, note that what does this Greek symbol mu nu denote? Well, as we all know that these Greek symbols are used to uh, denote some kind of uh, uh, indices or anything related to tensor. So mu nu in this Einstein field equation, uh, mu nu can be used for different purpose, but particularly to this context, it denotes space time in four dimensions. So uh, uh, the first zero would be the time factor, one the x axis, two the y axis and three the z axis. So you can see these are the spatial dimensions which are measured by mu nu and zero being the time. Now if I try to plot this entire mu nu concept in an xy axis, uh, we, uh, I, am, I am not taking into account the z axis because it would be difficult to show. So this t would be the time which is shown on the y axis and x, y, z are the three spatial dimensions and this one is the time and x, y, z, z would be the space. So mu nu basically denotes the space time in four dimensions which is used extensively in Einstein's field equations. Now we know uh, as you have observed me that I have been speaking about Einstein's field equations using a plural. However, Einstein, uh, the single equation is seems to be a single equation. However, these are not uh, a single equation. It consists of 16 nonlinear partial differential equations in a spherical or you can say in different coordinate system. So uh, let us see wha how, what makes up the 16 uh, partial or PDEs. So R mu nu, uh, as we have noted, mu nu denotes 
four dimensions of space time the g mu nu again another four dimension we have a repetition of g mu nu so it takes up another four dimension and the stress tensor t mu nu taking up four dimension so together they make up 16 equations but note right on the bottom of the screen i have written six equations are duplicate so this makes them a total of 10 non-linear partial differential equations so 16 are the equations we deduct those six equations and re we reduce it to 10 non-linear pdes so in the coming few slides i will be showing what are the duplicate equations or rather i would say what are the duplicate components which actually leads uh, to 10 differential equations instead of uh, 16. So this actually shows the 16 equations if we consider the mu nu which is the dimension of space and time. Now we all know from our basic uh, linear algebra course which you have done in our school days that what is a symmetric matrix. So we take into account this uh, simple 3x3 three three matrix where I have circled 1, 2 and 3 and if I transpose it it would lead to this. So you all know what is a symmetric matrix. So on the on on the uh, with whatever the code uh, numbers that you consider, what is on the horizontal, if you transpose it, it lies the same. So there is no change. So this is what is a basic definition of a symmetric matrix. You might be thinking why I'm doing so. It will just become clear in a few more uh, minutes when I would be explaining on this. So we should note that metric tensor is basically a symmetric tensor. In your screen, you can see the expanded part of the metric tensor, which is starts from G00 and it goes up to G33. And this is 4 by 4, so it takes up a total of 16 components. So, but among this, few of them are common. So you see G01 and G10 marked in red are common. G02 and G20 again is common. G03 and G30 are common. So by the term common, it doesn't. It actually means that they might carry different value. But if we take these into accounts, these are cons these can be deducted from the metric tensor. So if we go on like this, G01, G10, G02, G20, G03 equals to G30, and if we continue like this, we get a symmetric tensor. That means the components G mu nu equals to G nu mu. So it is evident from this that if we continue discarding the duplicate uh, components from this tensor, it leads to a symmetric tensor. So these are the 10 components of the metric tensor when we reduce them from 16. So you can see uh, on the top 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. And also note one thing that all these components in this G mu nu metric, that is the metric tensor, all are unique. That means there is no duplicate among the components and this leads to the 10 components of the metric tensor. So by now what we have learned is that we have learned that how we are reducing the 16 components of a tensor to 10 components and we are eliminating those which are common. Similarly, if we consider the T mu nu, which is a stress energy momentum tensor, we will uh, see that this also reduces to 10. This is the complete uh, T mu nu, the, it is a complete uh, stress energy tensor. So T01, T10, T02, T20, T03 and 30. In this similar way, which we did in metric tensor, if we continue eliminating those components, then what it would finally leave is that this one so t mu nu would now become equal to t nu mu which is again a symmetric tensor so uh, the stress energy momentum tensor we reduce we reduce the six components in the t mu nu that is the stress energy momentum tensor we reduce the uh, uh, the the common components so this is what it is you see on the left hand side of the screen it is just similar to the metric tensor g mu nu and all you can see here all the components are unique and this leads to the 10 components of stress energy momentum tensor so uh, this actually shows that how we can reduce the duplicate components from uh, metric tensor to stress energy momentum tensor and it leads to 10 components now let us summarize quickly what we learned about the Einstein field equations. This is uh, the complete uh, field equations written over there. Now if you consider from R mu nu to lambda g mu nu which I have marked it in red. This is actually which shows the curvature of space time as determined by the metric g. Now uh, we would be explaining about the concept of metric tensor but r for, for, the, for the moment just understand that we are trying to measure something. 
so measurement relates to metric which we denote by small g right so this part which i have shown in red leads to the cur curvature of space time and how do we measure it we measure it by the metric which is d further it reduce it goes to geometry of space time so the left hand side it is basically the ge geometry of space time which is determined by the metric g on the right hand side which i have marked in blue you can see this is actually the matter energy content of space time that means what whatever be the amount of matter the uh, the, the components related to matter everything is everything is explained on the right hand side this actually leads to the matter movement that means anything uh, any matter which is moving through space time and both the geometry of space time and the mo matter movement is being equal so i believe this gives you a clear picture how geometry of space time and matter movement are related to each other so the curvature which leads to the geometry equals to the matter content and it equals to the matter movement and that is why the left hand side of the efe einstein field equation equals to the right hand side we will soon see and things will become much clearer now we can alternatively write the einstein field equation in this way so we can take the r mu nu till half of r g mu nu and we can uh, summarize that as g mu nu as we will see this is basically the einstein tensor com component once we uh, shorten it like this this can be written as when we are substituting the g mu nu value right on the top which is marked in red we get g mu nu plus the rest of the factors followed by a kappa term which we are coming this one marked in blue actually shows you that this red marked uh, part of the equation the left hand side the two factors can be reduced and written in this way now this 8 pi g uh, whole divided by c40 mu nu is basically the kappa term we will uh, later deal into what this is actually all about this is more or less equivalent to the value that you are seeing 2.700 and this is basically the einstein gravitational constant right so uh, what i can tell you from here is that this c uh, raised to the power 4 is basically taken as the speed of light in four dimensions uh, we, which we will come in the later part of the uh, later into another video uh, the g is the gravitational constant newton's gravitational constant and 8 pi this pi factor is actually coming when we are computing the uh, the surface area of a sphere so we will see into that it actually comes from Poisson's um, uh, equation of gravity how the gravitational force is taken into account I'm not going into this right now so these are the components 8 pi factor comes from Poisson's equation and computation on a spherical surface g is the gravitational constant Newton t mu nu we will deal with this video and c to the raised to the power 4 is basically the dimension part of the speed of light so here you see that 8 pi g is basically uh, a constant uh, so that we can recover Newton's law of, of gravities for small and static masses now yes so Einstein tensor is defined by this which is right in front of your sc screen uh, G mu nu as we know it is the Einstein tensor and the Einstein tensor as we have seen is symmetric just like other tensor and it is representing the space-time curvature uh, 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 this curvature is basically due to matter distribution which follows through space and time and in fact the so-called gravitational force is nothing but it is the curvature which lets matter move so this is basically a kind of a concept where we are uh, rephrasing the Einstein field equation into Einstein tensor we will soon see what is the advantage of this well you need to know another thing that Einstein tensor have zero divergence that means if you take into fluid mechanics uh, divergence zero means whatever fluid is coming inside the uh, amount of fluid is going out I have just written this uh, in partial differential form so that it gives you a kind of a nice recap so now you might be uh, it might be going in your mind that uh, the significance of Einstein tensor having a zero divergence so you see g mu nu we have already seen is actually providing a curvature of space time t mu nu actually presence of energy and mass so and we know that these two are equal so the beauty of the zero divergence is this 
So you see g mu nu, which is the Einstein tensor, plus the lambda and the other term equals to the kappa term followed by the stress energy momentum tensor. Now, because we have seen that Einstein tensor have a zero divergence, so the left hand side has to be equal to something on the right hand side because the books need to balance. So the law of conservation has to balance. So that is why you see on the right hand side, which is uh, written in red, I have written that it has got a zero divergence to match the law of energy conservation. So because the Einstein tensor have got a zero divergence, why it has got a zero divergence, I won't go into the mathematical derivation. It equals to the uh, stress energy momentum sensor so that these two are balancing with the law of, cons uh, law of energy conservation. Now the covariant derivative as we have seen those who are not aware what is covariant derivative you can just understand that the ordinary derivative which we take uh, is not working in Riemannian manifold so we take something which is called a covariant derivative well this is not an exact definition. However, uh, I will make another video on what is the significance of covariant derivative. However, in this particular video understand that covariant derivative of Einstein tensor is set to zero and its connection with the stress tensor is defined by this term. Now this here you can see there is a gamma term which is used as a coefficient connection used defined in the matrix. Now here we can say that that Einstein tensor have zero divergence assuring the uh, uh, energy conservation of matter. Now the curvature of space time which is induced by the presence of matter that is the energy momentum tensor that means in a f it is a four dimensional version of the stress tensor you know that in fluid mechanics which describes the pressure fluid. Now the Newton's law of motion can be expressed as the vanishing of the divergence of the stress tensor. This generalizes to Minkowski space which we know where in addition to pressure we have something which we call energy and its flux. Now uh, one thing is quite clear uh, till now what we have discussed that when we proceed from space time to a curved space time we have to replace this one which you see on the left hand side the derivative followed by this reverse uh, what you call this uh, reverse delta which is called the Greek letter nabla. So uh, this uh, is, is uh, you know changed uh, it is replaced by a covariant derivative so hence whatever is on the other side of the equation it must have a vanishing divergence. So that you understand by this time the zero divergence of the stress tensor which we showed earlier comes from the requirement of the conservation of matter and energy and after formulating the Einstein field equation it follows that the left hand side which was Einstein tensor must have a zero divergence in order to meet with the uh, right hand side that is the stress tensor. So let us make a quick summary what we have learned. The vanishing of the divergence of Einstein's tensor is the same uh, with what we got as the divergence of the energy momentum tensor. The physical reason why we get the vanishing of divergence is basically the energy conservation and it is most natural for the generalization of curved space time. We have also seen that the long uh, Einstein field equation can be written in a much more shorter way. And this can be regarded as a consequence of the fact that the theory must be independent of choice of coordinates. If you have seen my earlier video where I have in the in the in the curvature space time I have told that general theory of relativity doesn't deal with even any coordinate system. It picks up arbitrary places in the manifold. So we need to get hold of something which is independent of the choice of coordinates. So now you see I, we can summarize this Einstein tensor should be equal to on the right hand side which is a stress energy momentum tensor. Okay, so we now come to the uh, next part of the video. What do we mean? Now we have seen that the curvature of space time is basically uh, for the reason it has got matter. Now if I may ask you that what is matter, what causes uh, the constituents of matter, you would say it is mass, right? But we, you know we have moved out from the Newtonian concept of mass and the, when we moved into relativ relativistic concept of mass where we have seen that there are a lot of other concepts called relativistic mass, rest mass, etc. 
So what I'm trying to uh, tell you is that from Newtonian concept when we are moving into special theory of relativity and further we are generalizing into general theory of relativity, there are a lot of components which actually makes up a matter. It is just not the mass, it is just not the rest mass, it contains uh, you know a relativistic mass, rest mass and lot of things. So we actually need a whole catalog of uh, you know components which would actually describe mass. So here is the uh, uh, simple uh, question what consists of uh, matter which causes space time. Now here on your screen you see I have uh, uh, simply written the equation which is the relativistic mass. This is what is called the total energy of a mood moving body which is uh, which is given from the uh, Lorentz boost of the uh, uh, spe special theory of relativity. Now if, if once this consists of uh, mass so what are the things what are the essential essential constituents which makes up matter. So you see I have written down energy, density, momentum, flow of energy, pressure and stress. So all these six components actually now makes up what we call matter. So the energy momentum tensor in physics dis describes the local distribution of mass, momentum and energy. We will soon see. So the, this is basically uh, a kind of a understanding that from Newtonian mechanics moving to relativity and further to general relativity, it is not so simple to define matter or mass. It actually contains lot of things. So we need to have a concrete picture, picture in which we can plug in all those components. So for example in two dimension I have got this. So you see uh, I have got a 2x2 two two matrix and the red one is the energy density, the purple one is the momentum density and the green one is the pressure. For example we get it this in two dimension. Now what happens if I expand this into four dimension. On the bottom right hand side of the screen you see this is a complete 4x4 four four mat matrix and you have got dimensions t, x, y and z. If you remember right at the beginning we to we, we, uh, I told you that uh, in the uh, Einstein field equation we are measuring space time in 4 dimension which is uh, denoted by the Greek letter mu and nu. So this is actually the stress energy momentum tensor. So this 2 dimension gets expanded into 4 dimension how we are going to explain you one by one. Now in two dimension let us take this purple part okay this is uh, considered to be momentum density don't worry we, I will be explaining you what the definition of momentum density and ignore if you already know one. So uh, those marked in red if it contains momentum density now if I expand this momentum density into three dimensions you see this comes this on the right hand side. So you see uh, on the top the, you have three coordinate system x, y and z which has been further given into 3 by 3 matrix. So what I am trying to do over here is that I am considering a fictitious kind of a matrix 2 by 2 where I am taking the momentum density in 2 dimension and I am ex ex expanding it to 3 dimensions. Now for example I get further from this uh, t by t uh, axis I go into this t xx t sub xx which is we call is the pressure part. Now if I expand it further then you see again we get something like this x y and z and this is actually what we call is pressure. So uh, earlier you have the, seen the momentum density getting expanded pressure is further getting expanded into three uh, into three components of a tensor. and you have got this. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six other components. So just to uh, take a note in between you must we must note that because general theory of relativity deals with positions which are arbitrary in the manifold we must take into account a tensor. Why? Because if you have seen my earlier video in tensor it actually explain, uh, explains that things are invariant okay things are not uh, varying only the, uh, the the basis of the vectors are cha changing so we need to have something which is invariant under coordinate transformation when we are moving from an euclidean to non-euclidean non place 
space so here on your screen on the right hand side you see the stress energy momentum tensor you we, we note that although we call this <laughs> as stress energy momentum tensor it is nothing but the extension of the classical stress tensor which we know in uh, uh, Newtonian uh, mechanics it is a relativistic extension it actually describes the momentum flux through space-time and most importantly it gives rise to whatever you call gravity and general relativity so here is the space-time vector uh, space-time 4 vector which is defined by this uh, r is vector which is pointing towards this 4 and the energy momentum vector which is defined by e let us go forward and uh, see what this energy momentum 4 vector is defined as so this one if we consider it the e uh, denotes the energy which is from the einstein's field e uh, equation e equals mc squared then we got momentum in x direction we got the momentum in y direction and we got the momentum in z direction so this is basically the uh, the expansion of the newtonian stress energy tensor into relativistic stress stress energy tensor but <laughs> yeah so this is just a vector which can be written in the form of a row but what we are looking is we are looking for a tensor why we are looking for a tensor because we need to find out a component which is invariant in coordinate transformation when we are moving from a euclidean uh, uh, space to a non-euclidean space so here on your screen is what we call is a stress energy momentum tensor now we are going to explain it uh, one by one but you see on the left hand side you see t00 which is the energy density this t01 to t03 is the energy flux and on the left hand side you see the momentum density so just to give you a uh, clarity that any part of energy that we are thinking anything that we uh, that we can visualize as an energy it can be pure energy rest mass relativistic mass stress whatever it finds somewhere a home this is the house so somewhere it finds a kind of a resting place in the home and this is what uh, uh, what the stress energy momentum tensor uh, uh, consists of now you see on the left hand side this t00 which is the energy density it will always predominate the energy tensor why because energy as we know from einstein's field equation equals m e equals to mc squared and here it goes i have marked it in red c squared because the magnitude of the velocity of the light is so huge that is the reason that energy density will always be predominant factor and that is why it is right on the time part of the stress energy momentum tensor the first component of the tensor so because of the uh, magnitude of the speed of light it will always be the uh, always be predominant now if i uh, go for the meaning of the terms just a quick recap energy density as you know it is the amount of energy stored in a given system per unit volume so it is get per length cubed energy flux is something which is called uh, you know a rate of transfer where, where energy is moving through a surface momentum density uh, it is there on the screen i've just given a kind of a equation it is not true here but it is the, uh, it is true in the electromagnetic wave field the momentum per unit volume we get the pressure term uh, which is f by upon a and we get shear stress which is denoted by the tau symbol which is the force applied whole divided by the cross sectional area which is uh, denoted by m squared so these are the quick four or five terms which we uh, went earlier so these are the meaning of the terms now in the stress energy momentum tensor if you see on the uh, right on the right hand side we will deal first with the energy density so you see the energy that is responsible for the curvature of space time we have already s shown a kind of an intuitive approach that because mass equals to energy and because energy equals to mc squared so definitely the energy would be responsible for the mass which is responsible for the curvature of space time uh, we deal with pressure also so I have give, given a small icon where a hand is squeezing an object so if we squeeze an object hard it can deform the surface so this deformation is something which we call uh, the uh, is responsible for curving the space-time so pressure also acts as a source of space-time curvature 
energy flux well uh, it is something analogous to uh, you can think that um, when you're sitting in front of a window and uh, the la the sun rays are streaming from the window direct directly to you so this 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 flow of the sunlight is something which we call the flux or you can call energy flux so movement of matter uh, say from one place to another if I roll a ball from one place to another it causes some energy to transfer from one place to another so this energy transfer from one place to another is what is called energy flux so automatically energy flux because it is related to matter it is something which causes the space-time curvature so energy density followed by the pressure followed by energy flux now we are left with another factor which is called the momentum density so i have just given a basic equation momentum flow equals to mass flow multiplied by momentum or mass so energy and momentum because they're closely related to each other momentum actually plays a pivotal role in the space-time curvature so uh, all these factors actually now you see energy plus momentum plus pressure plus stress actually makes up this blue area which is the matter and this matter causes a dent or it causes a curvature in space time so this actually concludes our discussion or it actually shows how the stress energy momentum tensor and how the components of this tensor are contributing to the fact of matter and eventually curving the space time so here you see energy momentum pressure and stress it contributes to making up the stress tensor denoted by t mu nu which is also a zero divergent tensor so it leads to zero divergence and uh, don't worry about this this is ba basically what we have uh, we find that when we use the covariant derivative how the zero divergence happen and it is energy not mass that is the source of gravity now uh, obviously one question comes into the mind which I was also thinking so it is good uh, time to take a note that if the zero divergence of stress energy momentum tensor uh, leads to the conservation of the energy, energy, uh, energy then can we tell that zero divergence of stress tensor is responsible for the conservation of energy? It's an obvious question. The answer actually is no. The answer is no. Actually what happens, I will tell you, the zero divergence of the stress energy momentum tensor does not directly imply the energy conservation, rather it implies indirectly. Now as I told you earlier that when we are considering a manifold, especially in general theory of relativity, we are not using the uh, vanishing divergence in the ordinary uh, I would say uh, in the ordinary sense or the ordinary derivatives so the covariant derivative divergence involved implies implies vanishing divergence in one coordinates frame which implies vanishing in all other coordinate system so to show every momentum conservation we have to include the energy momentum of gravitational field and then conserve divergence uh, and it is just the ordinary divergence similarly in charge conservation in young mills vanishing gauge converge uh, covariant divergence of the matter field holds in all frames of reference that is it is gauge invariant but the change of matter is not conserved since the gauge bosons also carry charge now you have to take into account gauge boson charges and then show the ordinary divergence of the combined matter along with the field current and then it vanishes so uh, just to make things easier on a note that the ordinary divergence does not vanish it is the covariant divergence which vanishes so in order to vanish and make it equal to the law of conservation of energy we have to first make zero divergence of the ordinary uh, uh, divergence and then only one frame of reference will be equal to the another frame of reference so if this is not the right way to say that zero divergence is responsible for conservation of energy no because the ordinary divergence doesn't vanish it is only that the covariant divergence vanishes So here we get the left hand side just to summarize and here is the quadrant we have uh, covered what is called the energy density we have also seen what is energy flux we have also covered momentum density and we have covered the fourth quadrant that is shear stress tensor which actually comprises of pressure and shear stress all these four coordinates 
actually contributes in making up stress energy momentum tensor which eventually causes the curvature of space-time. So this is a quick time to take a break and I think that you can I will just quickly go and grab my cup of coffee and you can also take a break once we uh, start with the concluding next part of the video. Well you I can tell you this much that for a topologist there is no difference between this dancing cup of coffee and the hot and uh, you know yummy uh, donut which is waiting on your uh, plate. So time to take a break. So we come to the concluding part of our uh, discussion which is called the Ricci curvature tensor. Now before we start with the Ricci curvature tensor, although this is not the right, uh, I would say not the right video, but however I would like to tell you how the Ricci curvature tensor, the hierarchy, it happens. First we need to understand and we will do it in another video about what is called a Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, I call him to be a granddaddy because from the Riemann curvature tensor we go to Ricci curvature tensor. We should note that Ricci tensor is actually also a symmetric tensor which further leads to Ricci scalar and this Ricci scalar is basically a contraction of the Ricci tensor. We will see a part in this video. So Ricci scalar is basically a contraction of the Ricci tensor and the Ricci tensor eventually is a contraction of the Riemann curvature tensor. So uh, you don't worry about this equation which I have written. This is basically again we are working on the covariant derivative. So from the Riemanns we get the Ricci curvature tensor. From the Ricci curvature tensor we get to the Ricci scalar. And if even if we go back as I have shown in the arrow, Ricci scalar is a contraction of Ricci curvature which is a contraction of the Riemann curvature tensor. So this is just to know how we arrived at Ricci curvature or Ricci scalar. It is only through Riemann that it is possible. So uh, Ricci curvature actually uh, tracks a volume change along geodesics which means that how volume grows and shrink in geodesics. So depending on the curvature that is the manifold that we are dealing Ricci curvature R shows the change in volume and it happens either in a static way, a growing way or it is decreasing. So now it is the right time that when we, uh, when, we, when we see this sentence that Ricci curvature tracks volume change along geodesics, what do we actually mean? So for that let us go back quickly to our basic linear algebra and understand what is the change of volume under linear transformation in orthogonal and non-orthogonal plane. Well this is important because when we uh, when we tell what is a volume change, we need to understand the basic concept underlying what is a volume change. Now we have gone to our school days where we have calculated the determinant that I have done it uh, for a simple parallelogram. So if we uh, consider these two vectors W and V occurring on uh, this parallelogram which is on R2 that is two dimension then the uh, area of a parallel parallelogram can be calculated using this V and W vector using a determinant. Right? So we denote it by DET. Very simple. I am not going further to explain. We all have calculated these on our school days. Now what do we mean by volume growth? So uh, say for example I take a linear transformation Rn mapping on m dimensional space and I take an example of a, a one dimensional linear transformation. So here what happens T maps the interval 0 1 which is on the left hand side you can see on the x plane to the interval 0 3 on the x prime plane and uh, this actually shows something it becomes like this. So the determinant of the matrix 3 actually it shows that it stretches the object and their length is increased by a factor of 3. Now this, this is a simple one dimensional uh, linear transformation. Now if I take uh, something like this a 2D linear transformation and I am taking A, B, C, D followed by X and Y these are the two uh, components then it shows something like this. So you see I uh, on the left hand side uh, this is the uh, this is just a, a you know kind of a box which gets transformed here. We get the uh, x axis minus 2 which is plotted over there and we get the y axis also which is in blue uh, plotted over here. Now here what happens is this, the, the object actually rotates by pi radians. Now because this object is rotating and stretching it is increasing the area by a factor of 4. So this is a kind of a typical example of stretching two dimensional linear transformation. 
if I take a three-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional linear transformation where I am stretching and flipping the parallelogram, uh, the, the square, it becomes something like this. So you can see that the T doubles the area, right? And the orientation is also reversed. Orientation means if you move counterclockwise, uh, just take an, uh, you can do this on the screen. If you move counterclockwise, it leads in the opposite color. So you see from the blue, the blue is here and uh, the yellow is over here. So here, the basic essence to give you is that the area is doubled and the orientation is also reversed. Now let us take an uh, example of a three-dimensional linear transformation. So we take the three-dimensional linear transformation, something like this, where I'm taking three axes, x, y, z, and I'm computing it as ax, and we take the matrix from a11 to a33. Now I've got a cube, uh, something like this, which is plotted on the x, y, z axis. Here it is. So you see that the cube has transferred into a parallelopiped and the stretching if we calculate the determinant which we did earlier stretches the volume to 12. So the expansion of the volume of t is reflected by the fact that determinant of a becomes 12 and the t the uh, the the, the t, uh, actually rotates the cube and stretch it to a parallel pipette of volume 12. So this is uh, and but but most most importantly the same four colors are in the same order when it is moving counterclockwise. Right. So this is a typical example where a cube is getting uh, linearly transformed into a parallelopiped. The de determinant of the cube when calculated expands to 12. So that means it has stretched and the volume has also increased. Let us go for a quick summary on linear transformation. So transformations uh, determinant specifies how the volume changes. So if we get classically volume determinant is 1, the volume is preserved. If it is negative, there is a mirroring and the face is reversed. When orth uh, if it is doing an orthogonal transforms, then the shape is actually preserved. So what happens right on the screen, you see the cube is being stretched to a cuboid where the length I have marked it in red increases. The uh, sphere gets extended to an oblate spheroid. So you can see the blue mark. Uh, which is on the sphere gets extended much uh, bigger in the oblate spheroid. So if I take these two things, the parallelopiped and uh, sorry, the yes, the cube uh, transferring to parallelopiped, sphere, sphere going to oblate spheroid, the volume if I consider it to be zero, when it is uh, transformed, it becomes V0 multiplied by the magnitude of X multiplied by the magnitude of Y multiplied by the magnitude of z. So this is actually a way in which we show that the volume is increasing. So uh, now we have to understand that these are all happening on an orthonormal basis. So everything is in orthonormal basis. But we need to understand one thing that general theory deals with non-orthonormal basis but or rather it deals with an arbitrary system. So whatever the linear transformation that I have been showing are basically on an orthonormal basis. So the question is that can we take the same a transformation uh, equation or using the same method can we do it in a non-orthonormal basis obviously no and here we have to introduce a concept which is called volume form or volume element which is denoted by the term omega now the volume form the definition goes it is a special differential form defined on an oriented Riemannian manifold which introduces a natural concept of measure on the manifold and it is a tensor. So just to take into account let us uh, uh, you know simplify terms it volume form or volume element is going to calculate volume but not on an orthonormal basis which is in a non-orthonormal basis and which takes care of different curvatures etc and it is a natural concept concept of measure. So it is measurement only but on a different manifold. So uh, let us see uh, what is the volume form. Let us go uh, on a very simple definition. So if I take a cuboid, we calculate the volume uh, which is length multiplied by breadth multiplied by height. But if we take a volume integral, say for example if we take the same cuboid, then the volume integral is the basically a triple integral which I have taken over the different uh, differential of x, y and z. 
and the volume element which we consider is the differential element of dv that is the differential of v whose volume integral over some surface which i have mentioned just as dg in a given coordinate system is given by this so v e equals to the triple integral of the differential of the axis x y and z so here I have shown in the blue arrow that from volume element which is the differential of the x, y and z components taken over a triple integral goes to a volume integral which is basically the differential and it leads to volume. So from volume we go to volume element integral and from volume integral we calculate the volume element. Now in the volume element uh, for example if you are taking a cube uh, which is in a Euclidean space V means it is an integration of a function with respect to volume in various coordinates so differential of the volume equals to what the differential of X Y and Z quite clear if you take a spherical coordinate system which is there on the left hand side of your screen obviously in spherical coordinate system we have to include the sine theta and the differential element of Phi so the volume element is this which is R squared times the sine theta of d theta d phi of dr and if you're considering the polar coordinate system we get this one which is the differential volume so uh, the basic essence uh, is to make you understand that basically volume element and volume form is uh, is the understanding of the volume but in a different way because we are moving from the orthonormal to the non-orthonormal basis so I will just show you in a quick simple example what is a volume form. So for example if we take this particular parallelogram in a two dimension A and B are the two acting vectors. So we get the volume V equals to omega of the two acting vectors A and B. If I take a similar kind of a cube where there are three, uh, uh, three uh, vectors A, B and C then the volume is given by omega of A, B and C. Now uh, if you have seen my earlier videos where the tensor is being taken by uh, uh, I would say uh, from uh, old basis to new basis I have always mentioned it by E1 tilde or E2 tilde. Here you see that the parallelogram is non-orthonormal. It is not in 90 degrees. It is tilted and so are the basis vector. So what do we do just from the uh, you forget the right hand part the cube part let us take the parallelogram which is in two dimension concentrate on the on the uh, on the parallelogram on the two dimension here what we do is that we calculate the determinant by taking a square root okay I'm not going into why it is done because then we have to show the entire equation this is the determinant followed by a square root followed by the determinant of G this G if you can recall is basically the metric tensor I hope now you can understand the link because metric tensor actually denotes any measurement on the Riemannian manifold which is the key for general relativity so when we are calculating the determinant of this particular uh, matrix then we have to take the square root of the determinant of the metric tensor followed by the determinant of this normal uh, vectors which is B1 B2 and A1 E2 now you see that this determinant of G actually takes care of the transformation from orthonormal to non-orthonormal basis. So if we are transferring a volume which I have shown earlier that from the Euclidean place we cannot do the same linear transformation and measure a volume so we have to take care of the volume form which is a differential volume but the differential volume has to take care of a metric tensor because we, we are taking arbitrary basis right. So from here from non-orthonormal to orthonormal this is taken care by the determinant square root of the determinant of metric tensor followed by this epsilon sign don't worry this is called the Levi Civita symbol uh, I will make another video on Levi Civita symbol it is just a simple way of writing the indices of the tensor because note we are using two dimension I have mentioned epsilon i and j so for the two vectors we get two components i and j followed by the ith element of b vector and the jth element of a vector and this arrow in blue shows that it gives the volume form or volume element of the two dimension and it takes care of the square root of the metric tensor so this one is the volume form on non-orthonormal non basis and this is the volume form on orthonormal basis so uh, so we can write it more cleanly so this is the volume form on non-orthonormal which is volume equals to the omega of ABC and V denotes volume 
this is the volume form of non-orthonormal bases where V equals to omega ABC followed by the determinant of metric tensor G Y because it takes arbitrary uh, points followed by the Levi Civita symbol epsilon now you see I have written I J K why I have written I J K because we are comparing this now with a cube which is a three dimensional object and we have to write i j k so the ith term of c the jth term of a followed by the kth term of b so now to avoid further derivations i have kept a simple form which is the minus r and this is actually the ricci tensor so you now can relate that from the non orthonormal we move to orthonormal basis from two dimension I showed you a two dimensional orthonormal calculation then we come to the three dimensional orthonormal calculation from this three dimensional orthonormal I am showing you that this V actually relates to the Ricci tensor so the change of volume which is determined by the root over of determinant of metric tensor now comes here in the Ricci tensor this minus term uh, is basically uh, uh, indication which shows that the uh, the curvature is positive what is curvature is what means uh, by, by positive curvature we will just show in a few uh, moments so you can see this purple line this V and this V are the same right so that actually proves that the volume change from the non orthonormal basis to Ricci tensor is actually the change of volume along the geodesics so for example we get this kind of a sphere which is uh, uh, it is a fear sphere and here are <laughs> you know I have just drawn a few people walking around the sphere the orange and the green one so if they are moving along the geodesic in this purple line eventually they meet at the North Pole right similarly on the right hand side you see a sphere and I have marked it in red and these are converging geodesics these are actually meeting at a point and here is a ball I move the ball further and further and further and further so what actually happens the ball actually shrinks in size now I think you can visualize and understand what is actually called shrinking in size which is taken care from the Ricci curvature tensor now this part of shrinking in size is actually taken care by the Ricci tensor so you see on the bottom of the screen I have written the R in red because you need to understand that gravity in general theory of relativity is nothing an external force which we consider in Newtonian mechanics gravity is basically a natural tendency of, of the curvature of geodesics so I have written on the right hand side the ball shrinks in size as it moves along the geodesic meaning the curvature is positive so if you remember previously I have shown that this minus R don't worry that was basically a derivation when Einstein put it that was the negative sign uh, uh, is not here so this R actually denotes that the curvature is positive and positive curvature is actually means that things or the matter will converge and it shrinks in size so uh, R in uh, general theory of relativity is the curvature tensor and it is basically a measurement of gravity which is a natural tendency of the curvature of space-time not anything external as a force this is a change in volume if I move this box uh, yes so it goes from here to here you see there is no change in volume so the stretch geodesic so I have just taken three dimensions V1, V2, V3 the Ricci curvature becomes zero in this kind of a converged geodesics if I move the cube one two three four and five you'd see it reduces right in volume so because Ricci curvature is greater than zero that means it has got a positive curvature positive curvature means that the volume is shrinking if I take a, this kind of a geodesic, uh, the last one on the left hand side of your screen, this is actually d diverging geodesic. So what happens? It goes here and then here and then here. So eventually what is happening? It is increasing in size. So you can just take a quick capture of this uh, screen. So we have got three types of curvatures where the volume is not changing, a flat one the straight geodesic where uh, uh, the volume is not changing equals to zero the converging geodesics where the uh, where the curvature is more greater than zero it is converging and the increase in uh, volume which is the diverging geodesics where the Ricci curvature is less than zero so the Ricci scalar uh, as you see over here which I have pointed out 
now we will come to the point of Ricci scalar so you see the Ricci scalar actually keeps track of how the size of a ball deviates from standard Euclidean space now note don't get confused between Ricci scalar and Ricci curvature Ricci curvature is actually a measurement how a ball or an object shrinks in size or it grows in size or it remains static uh, based on the curvature of space-time but Ricci scalar actually shows how a ball deviates the ch change in the ball we will I will show you in the another video how we come and we um, uh, numerically we measure Ricci scalar when we parallel transport things so uh, here uh, the ball deviates from the Euclidean space so this is a flat circle in a two dimension in uh, in a, uh, in three dimension then not, then it gets to a disk and when we try to pose this disk on the sphere I, I mean to say I am immersing this disk on a sphere it actually takes more area so this is what Ricci scalar does so the uh, keeping track of the volume in Euclidean space and how it deviates in a non Euclidean space so here this red arrow shows that if I'm trying to fit this disk on the sphere it is actually taking more area so uh, I will continue with Ricci scalar with few more examples here is the area of the circle which is pi r squared now this black area which I have shown I'm trying to fit that circle over here so what it is happening the area is increasing the surface area further gets increased as the uh, as the sphere gets smaller and finally you see that it further increases and here the area equals to 2 pi r squared right so this is basically a sense when we are trying to uh, I would say when, when we are trying to uh, immerse a circle and we want to see that how this circle is deviating from the Euclidean space to the non Euclidean uh, space when we are putting it on the sphere this is actually uh, what Ricci scalar does so here is a quick note that as a circle becomes shorter circle becomes shorter means the curvature is more positive we can fit more area hence we can say that we can fit large amount of area in a small boundary so here are the uh, geodesic deviations uh, simple this is a flat one uh, where Ricci is 0 R there is no increase in volume this is uh, is a convergent geodesic which I have s shown on a sphere where the Ricci curvature is greater than zero and the volume decreases and the last one which I have taken a saddle uh, well there are uh, other uh, I would say other uh, visualizations of a negative curvature but uh, it is good to go with a saddle so here you see that the geodesics are diverging and R is less than zero so the volumes increases so three simple example of geodesic devi geodesic deviations and how R is actually measuring no volume increase volume decreases and the volume increase so here is a flat uh, circle R equals to zero and when I'm imposing or po uh, trying to fit it over a sphere the area is more and again taking the same r equals to 0 when I'm trying to fit on a saddle or where there is a uh, you know kind of negative curvature the it occupies a lesser area so here we come to this equation so you see on the left hand side r sub a b is equivalent okay let me let me explain you one by one so this is the Ricci tensor we are quite clear on this this one is the Riemann curvature tensor okay this one you have already recognized G is the metric tensor and this one is the Riemann curvature tensor most important part in this uh, equation you see that this one the C and D which is the first and the third indices are being contracted in the Riemann cur in the Ricci uh, in the Riemann tensor so I have written the Ricci curvature tensor is a contraction of the first and the third index of Riemann tensor I think I have shown it earlier also so in the uh, in the uh, in the Ricci curvature tensor you see the C part that is the red one on your right hand side is not there and the third one two three the D part is omitted so we contract the first and third index of Riemann curvature tensor and we put it in the Ricci tensor so now we come up to the end part of the video it is nice time that we should summarize what we have learned so we have learned what is mu nu and it uh, actually is a measurement of four dimensions of space and time 
we have also learned how we can reduce the 16 partial differential equation to 10 by reducing the redundant uh, components of the metric tensor and the uh, stress energy tensor we have al always seen that Einstein tensor and its zero divergence property and we have also seen that why Einstein tensor's zero divergent property equals to the stress energy tensor zero divergent property and both the sides balance. We have also taken a quick note on stress energy momentum tensor however I have got some more ideas in uh, putting up and making a separate video on stress energy momentum tensor. We have also seen change of volume under linear transformation and how it leads to volume element and differential volume. We have seen what is a Ricci curvature tensor and it leads to the change of volume under geodesics. And finally, we have seen what is a Ricci scalar, which is the, uh, you know, how a circle uh, changes or the amount of deviation from Euclidean to non-Euclidean space. So thank you for watching the video. I think that it has been a little bit long, but it was required because a lot of integrated concepts were required into this. Do subscribe and like and comment. And I would really like, I would appreciate if you are putting up comments in my channel. One thing which is left, I understand, which is not uh, complete is the metric tensor. So I am coming up with another video where I'm explaining the mathematical and the intuitive understanding of metric tensor. So once this metric tensor is done we are left with the cosmological constant the Poisson's gravitational equation and then we will uh, merge them together into the final I would say the integration part of Einstein's field equations so do this subscribe do like comment and let me know how you have liked the video any part which is confusing please do put up in the comment box and I would like to explain further thank you very much stay safe and stay happy and have a nice day